A History of Dieting As the indulgence of the holidays come to an end and a new year begins, many make resolutions to shed a few pounds. For hundreds of years, people have felt pressure to attain the ideal body type of their time. And they've come up with some eyebrow-raising, stomach-turning, and even deadly methods of losing weight. Let's explore body ideals through the ages and some of the most unbelievable diets people put themselves through to attain them. Do not try any of these historic weight loss methods at home. Spoiler alert, thousands of years of acquired medical knowledge and trying some really weird diets tell us that the best way to lose weight is to eat less and exercise more. And hundreds of years of pressure to attain unrealistic body ideals tells us that we should all try to love the bodies we are in. Paleolithic Era For much of human history, daily life centered around hunting and gathering enough food to merely survive. Early humans burned an enormous number of calories chasing down animals and walking from wild fruit trees to berry bushes to collect enough calories to power them to do it all again tomorrow. Very few people had excess body fat, and if they did, they were living the dream. A surplus of fat meant a better chance of survival when food was scarce, and a better chance of bearing healthy children. The woman of Wallendorf, a four-inch stone statue, was carved around 32,000 BCE and excavated in Austria. The figure of a woman with wide hips, a full stomach, and heavy breasts was most likely a fertility fetish and represented the ideal woman of the time. Of course, like all body ideals, she was significantly exaggerated from what Stone Age women actually looked like. Agricultural Revolution Fast forward to 10,000 BCE, and the agricultural revolution made getting enough food to survive a little easier. Once people began staying in one place, farming and domesticating animals, the ratio of calories consumed to calories burned went up. This surplus of food allowed the human population to grow, towns and cities to be built, and class structure to develop. For most people, the margins were still very slim. A year of bad harvest meant starvation, and very few people got more than enough to eat. But for those in the emerging ruling class who claimed tribute from others and built their wealth over generations, being overweight was beginning to be possible. In many ancient cultures, fatness was seen as a sign of health and wealth. The ancient Greeks and Romans idolized beautiful bodies. They invented the Olympics after all. The word diet comes from the ancient Greek dieta, which encompassed an entire lifestyle including food, drink, sleep, and exercise. The wealthy were able to spend hours in gymnasiums, running, throwing discs, and wrestling, all while naked, to attain the ideal trim, muscular, and male physique. The masculine form was seen as ideal, while the female body was considered a malformation. Women naturally have more body fat than men, as we need it to support pregnancy and breastfeeding. So when the ancient Greeks put the male form on a pedestal, they set up an ideal that was much harder for women to achieve. And this imbalance has reverberated through time. Ancient Greek physician Hippocrates disapproved of excess consumption of food, drink, and other bodily pleasures. His recommendations to those who wanted to lose weight. Drink lukewarm wine before exercising. Eat one meal a day of rich seasoned food so that you will be satisfied. Stop bathing and sleep on a hard bed. There is a common historical misconception that wealthy Greeks and Romans gorged themselves at feasts and then when they couldn't down another bite, they would visit the vomitorium to make room for even more. 
While they did adore whimsical feasts, vomitoriums were actually the entrances and exits of large venues, like the Colosseum, where people were vomited out into the street, not food. Early Christians saw the body as the enemy of the soul, and they discouraged all physical pleasure. Gluttony was added to the list of seven deadly sins, though those sins are not actually mentioned in the Bible. In the 600s, Pope Gregory I defined gluttony not as just eating too much, but also eating too eagerly, being picky, enjoying your food, or even snacking between meals. Holy men St. Anthony, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, and St. Basil all took their turns starving themselves in an attempt to be more holy. Many nuns emulated their starvation in what became known as anorexia mirabilis, or holy anorexia. These women endured malnutrition and resulting health problems and even death. When Catherine of Siena was 16, her sister died in childbirth. She was terrified when her parents ordered her to marry her sister's widow. In protest, she refused to eat and cut off her long hair. She became a nun and an important influence on Pope Gregory XI, but she continued to refuse food and drink, aside from daily communion and supposedly licking the pus from the sores of the poor. Her extreme fasting worried her sisters and her confessor who ordered her to eat properly. But Catherine described her inability to eat as an illness. In time, she was no longer able to swallow and had lost the use of her legs. She suffered a massive stroke and died at the age of 33. Catherine was canonized as a saint. Some historians theorize that anorexia mirabilis was behind Queen Catherine of Aragon's fertility problems. She was deeply religious and fasted frequently. She suffered from at least four miscarriages and stillbirths and had a son, Henry, who died at just 52 days old. Malnutrition and eating disorders are linked with premature labor and low infant birth weight. But with every tragedy, Catherine fasted even more in an attempt to please God and be granted a healthy child. Catherine's only surviving child was a daughter, Mary, and because Queen Catherine didn't give birth to a male heir, her husband, Henry VIII, split England from the Catholic Church in order to divorce her. King Sancho I of Lyon, known as Sancho the Fat, weighed in at 240 kilograms, or 530 pounds. He had an impressive appetite and ate seven meals a day of 17 dishes each, mostly consisting of red meat and game. His people ridiculed him for being unable to ride a horse, fight in battle, or consummate his marriage. He was deposed after two years on the throne, so he traveled to Cordova to be treated by Jewish physician Hasdai ibn Shaprut. The doctor devised a brutal weight loss regime for the former king. He was locked in a room with his hands and feet bound, and only let out once a day when he was forced to take long walks, during which he was pulled with ropes while leaning on an assistant. After the excruciating exercise, Sancho was subjected to lengthy steam baths. To further prevent his majesty from eating, Hasdai sewed Sancho's lips shut, allowing only a small opening in which a straw could be inserted for him to sip a concoction of water and liquefied fruits, vegetables, herbs, and opium. This gave him constant diarrhea. These drastic measures did produce results, and Sancho lost about half his body weight. He was then treated with aggressive massage to try and firm up his flabby skin. Now able to ride a horse and lie with a woman, he retook the throne. He ruled for another six years before dying at 34 and leaving Leon to his five-year-old son, Ramiro III. 
By the end of the Middle Ages, the wealthy at least had access to all the food they needed and much more. They consumed meat, white bread, sugar, and alcohol in excess and considered vegetables to be peasant food. Doctors even advised against eating raw plants as they were believed to be toxic. Renaissance paintings and sculptures illustrate that a voluptuous figure was the ideal of beauty. A full bust and hips, but a slim waist for women, and a muscular physique with particular emphasis on a well-turned calf for men. While women relied on corsets and men on padded stockings to achieve this look, fasting and vomiting were still also employed. Within a few years of Gutenberg inventing the printing press, it was used to publish the first diet book. In 1474, Bartolomeo Sacchi wrote On Honorable Pleasure and Health. His treatise is also considered the first cookbook and makes numerous connections between what you eat and your health, which were a revelation at the time. Editions traveled across Europe and became incredibly popular among the nobility. In 1558, Venetian nobleman Luigi Cornato penned Discourses on the Sober Life. He explained that how, at the age of 40, he was exhausted and in poor health due to his hedonistic lifestyle. So he limited himself to only 12 ounces of food daily, including bread, egg yolk, meat, and soup, and 14 ounces of wine. That's about one turkey sandwich, a cup of soup, and three glasses of wine per day. Luigi promoted health and longevity, rejecting the common belief that old age was supposed to be a period of misery and decay. He lived to the age of 98. In his final years, he ate only egg yolks. In the 1600s, Italian Giacomo Castelvetro moved to England. He was shocked at the English upper-class diet, heavy on meat and sugar, and devoid of fresh fruits and vegetables. Giacomo's book, The Fruits, Herbs, and Vegetables of Italy, was the first book to tout the Mediterranean diet. In 1724, English doctor George Shane wrote an essay of health and long life, in which he advised a vegetarian diet. In 1797, Scottish surgeon John Rollo recommended the opposite and claimed a meat-heavy diet was the best treatment for the newly discovered illness of diabetes. Industrial Revolution In the late 17 and early 1800s, the Industrial Revolution once again changed the world's way of living and eating. Millions gave up farming and eking out just enough sustenance to survive for jobs in urban factories and food purchased at the market. Mechanized, steam-powered farm equipment meant that fewer people were needed to grow greater quantities of food. Now it wasn't only the wealthy who had access to excess calories. Meanwhile, fashion and that exaggerated skirt and teeny tiny corseted waist for ladies and a trim, angular silhouette for men were also much more accessible. With these two opposing forces at work, the craze for dieting exploded in the 1800s. A number of trendsetters made eating disorders fashionable. English romantic poet Lord Byron, libertine and heartthrob, exercised frequently while wearing many heavy layers of clothes to induce sweating and smoked cigars to suppress his appetite. He lived on a diet of biscuits and soda water for days at a time, then gorged himself on a horrid mess of cold potatoes, rice, fish, or greens, diluted in vinegar, and gobbled it up like a famished dog. There are reports of women dying after drinking pints of vinegar trying to emulate Lord Byron. 
Empress Elizabeth of Austria, known as Sissy, was a fashion and beauty icon. She was also a terribly unhappy woman and controlled her figure, the one thing she had any power over, obsessively. She was five foot eight and refused to exceed 110 pounds. She had gymnasium equipment installed in her bedroom and went horseback riding for hours at a time. The Empress only consumed raw beef juice, milk, and eggs, and often refused to eat for days. She took laxatives and emetics regularly. She also wore a tight laced corset, and at a particularly low time in her life, had a waist that was only 16 inches in circumference. She developed a horror of overweight women and transmitted this attitude to her youngest daughter, who was terrified when, as a little girl, she met Queen Victoria. In Victoria's era, gender roles for women became even more rigid. A life spent in the home was seen as sufficiently fulfilling, and women who were too robust or active were frowned upon. The ideal of female beauty was a pale, slim girl without a hint of muscle, reposed on a fainting couch. Consumptives, those dying of tuberculosis, were considered especially beautiful. Anorexia was a common and dangerous way to chase this near-death look of waifishness. If a corset just wasn't enough, rubber undergarments were invented in the mid-1800s. They held everything in even tighter and had the added benefit of causing the wearer to sweat the pounds away. Both men and women got into the craze, but discovered that their skin, when kept continuously moist, began to break down. Sores and infections ensued. Still, these macerating knickers remained popular until rubber was rationed for World War I. In his 1825 book, The Physiology of Taste, French gastronome Jean Brie Savaron described starch and flour based foods as the culprit in obesity. American Presbyterian minister Sylvester Graham preached the virtues of vegetarianism and the evils of alcohol and sex. He sold graham crackers as a health food and believed that they would reduce carnal urges. So, the next time you have a s'more, don't even think about getting frisky by the campfire. In 1863, English undertaker William Banting wrote a best-selling pamphlet explaining how he lost 46 pounds by eating four meals per day consisting of meat, greens, fruit, and dry wine with every meal, even breakfast avoiding sugar, sweet foods, starch, beer, milk, and butter. Banting's methods became so popular that the verb banting became synonymous with dieting. Those who didn't bant might be more into Fletcherism. American Horace Fletcher, aka the Great Masticator, promoted chewing your food 100 times before swallowing or spitting out what was left. Fletcher warned, nature will castigate those who don't masticate. A sign of success in the diet was a lack of bowel movements. Dinner parties were held where attendants would silently chew their food to pulp as a waiter rang a bell every five minutes to inform them that it was time to swallow. By the turn of the 20th century, more people than ever had enough to eat and disposable income to spend on fashion and dieting. The corset hit its zenith in the 1890s with The Gibson Girl, the popular look based on Charles Dana Gibson's illustrations of an imagined woman of perfection. The silhouette featured an extremely slim waist and a pronounced curve at the back that forced the upper body forward and the derriere out. A great many hucksters offered quick and dangerous products to help women achieve this unnatural beauty standard. Diet pills touted as miracle cures contained small amounts of arsenic or strychnine, 
Some took more than the recommended dose, thinking that they would lose more weight faster and suffered deadly consequences. The tapeworm diet involved swallowing a tapeworm egg in a pill. The idea was that it would mature in the intestine and absorb all the food a person ate. Tapeworms can grow up to 30 feet in length. Along with weight loss, symptoms include diarrhea, vomiting, headaches, eye problems, meningitis, epilepsy, and dementia. Once the desired weight was reached, the host took an antiparasitic pill, which would hopefully kill off the tapeworm so that it could be passed, causing a number of abdominal and rectal complications on the way out. In the 19-teens and 20s, women in many nations won the right to vote. They threw aside their corsets and long skirts for short hair and shorter dresses and an androgynous silhouette free of curves. This liberated look favored a very thin, boyish frame. Women bound their breasts and took to even more dieting. Lucky Strike Cigarettes ran an ad campaign advising people to reach for a Lucky instead of a fattening treat. Chewing gum laced with laxatives also hit the market. In 1918, American physician Lulu Hunter Peters wrote the book Diet and Health, the first to promote calorie counting. She advised eating 1,200 calories a day. For some perspective, the consensus now is for 1,600 to 2,500 calories per day, depending on height, age, activity, and health. During the Great Depression and World War II, many went back to struggling to get enough calories to survive. Food was rationed, victory gardens sprung up everywhere, and meat, sugar, and other luxury foods were hard to find. When the war was over, economies boomed and people reveled in surplus once again. Christian Dior's new look of a large bust wide skirt and slender waist was a throwback to the Victorian era. The Slindo Massager, a spring-loaded cage which vigorously rubbed up and down the body, claimed to loosen up fatty tissue. That was the idea behind a number of vibrating belts and other contraptions which purported to jiggle away the fat without the need for exercise. Diet pills, known as Mother's Little Helpers, were prescribed to women by their doctors. They helped them to shed pounds and gave them a burst of energy for all that unpaid childcare and housework. The secret ingredient was amphetamines, which came with a host of dangerous side effects, ranging from hyperactivity, trouble sleeping, and mood swings to death. In the 1960s, Jean Niedicht, a housewife in Queens, New York, was dissatisfied with the many diets she had tried. So she developed Weight Watchers. The program uses a point system to measure the quantity and quality of food eaten. Weight Watchers and other dieting clubs, or slimming clubs as they are known in the UK, involve weekly weigh-ins and meetings to encourage weight loss in a socially supportive atmosphere. As of 2013, over a million people attend weekly Weight Watchers meetings around the world. In the swinging 60s, British model Twiggy's lean androgynous frame became the ideal. That look continued through the 70s with Vera Fawcett. In 1972, Dr. Robert Atkins promised that by cutting out carbs, people could eat as much protein and saturated fat as they wanted and still lose weight. The diet became popular again in the early 2000s with a line of shakes and meals. But the low-carb, high-fat diet has not been proven effective and comes with an increased risk of heart disease. Also in the 70s, Dr. Walter L. Vogelin popularized the Stone Age diet, which remains popular today under the name Paleo. This diet promotes meat-heavy eating, free from processed foods. The idea is to consume like our Paleolithic ancestors, who were lucky to get enough woolly mammoth meat to survive. 
The 1980s was the era of the supermodel. Thin was in like never before. It was rumored that some of these models maintained their svelte figures by eating cotton balls dipped in juice so that they would feel full without actually eating. Some tried this diet and ended up with blockages in the digestive system, dehydration, necrosis of the intestines, and serious damage to internal organs. Other fad diets of the decades included the cabbage soup diet, the grapefruit diet, the cottage cheese diet, the baby food diet, and even the Twinkie diet, all of which advised eating only their particular miracle food. AIDS, diet-suppressing candies, were in vogue until the global pandemic of the same name pushed them out of popularity. In 1988, Oprah Winfrey rolled out a wagon filled with 67 pounds of fat. She announced that she had lost that much by replacing every meal with a liquid protein drink. Slim Fast Shakes went mainstream and dozens of celebrities came out with their own aerobics videos and diet products. Liposuction was invented, making the surgical removal of fat safer and more affordable. The 1990s brought back the death store beauty ideals of the Victorian era with heroin chic. British model Kate Moss, who had a BMI of just 16, became the figure of the decade. This extreme thin came in response to the expanding waistline of the average person. In 1997, the World Health Organization announced that obesity was a global epidemic. Around the globe, calorie-dense processed foods have become easier than ever to obtain. And in many areas, fresh, healthier options are hard to find and more expensive. News reports frequently decry the obesity epidemic and the many health problems associated with it. But the prevalence, convenience, and affordability of processed foods with a host of mysterious and perilous ingredients and an excess of confusing information about exactly what constitutes a healthy diet make it all the more difficult to make healthy choices. And more fad diets only add to the confusion. Today, the diet industry is worth $66 billion. In the last two decades, the ideal body has bounced back to a more realistic size. Celebrities like Kim Kardashian and Jennifer Lopez have popularized fuller figures with an emphasis on larger thighs, hips, and butts. But there is still plenty of pressure from Photoshop perfect bodies on magazine covers and heavily filtered and modified images on social media. Centuries of reinforcement that only thin is healthy and beautiful is deeply damaging to people of every age and gender. This constant societal pressure has caused countless people to risk their health and even lose their lives to lose weight. In response has come the body positivity movement, which aims to celebrate everyone's body, no matter the size, shape, skin tone, gender, or physical ability. More and more, advertisers are showing a variety of body types in their ads. Curvy models have become mainstream, and even New York Fashion Week has been encouraging designers to feature more diverse models. People are pushing back on the beauty and diet industries that put forward unrealistic and unattainable body images. And we are hopefully all learning to feel proud and beautiful in whatever body we are in. Fresh fruits and vegetables, the foundation of a healthy diet, are expensive and millions of people can't afford them. To help combat nutritional insecurity, I will be donating ad revenue from this video to Wholesome Wave. 
They work with farmers, producers, and distributors to help low-income people get access to fresh produce. They double the value of food stamps when spent on fruits and vegetables, and work with doctors to write prescriptions for fresh produce. Wholesome Wave is fighting the obesity epidemic, preventing a wide range of related diseases, and helping people live longer, healthier lives. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other Royal History videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.